This is a bonus episode. It's as extra as I am. Hello, I'm John Rossi. I'm a touring drummer with a passion for animal conservation. When I'm on the road, I spend as much time as possible visiting zoos, aquariums, and conservation organizations. Now, I want to share those places with you. I'll be talking to keepers, vets, conservationists, anyone who can help me in my mission of connecting my people to animals through their people. Join me on my raw safari. Hello, 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 and welcome back to a bonus episode of the Raw Safari Podcast. Those of you that are caught up on the pod know that earlier this week, I released an episode with Deidre Osterhout, who is a former zookeeper and currently the host of Weird Animal Facts Explicit, a podcast that gives you weird animal facts and is explicit. And hence the name. Anyway, I mentioned that that was a pod swap, and I mentioned that it was a pod swap because along with her being on my podcast, I went on to her podcast to share some weird animal facts and be explicit while talking about red pandas. So now I'm bringing that episode to y'all. So if you didn't go over and listen to me on her feed, or if you did, whatever, now you can hear that episode right here. But, and I can't stress this enough, make sure that you then go over to Deidre's feed and hit subscribe because her podcast is fun, irreverent, and uh, really informative about animals. So like, if you're here, you're probably going to like being over there and, uh, Proof of concept is coming your way in this bonus episode. So, um, okay, that's that's really all I have to say about this. Without further ado, let's get to my appearance on the Weird Animal Facts Explicit podcast. Oh, and y'all, before I do this, um, it really is explicit. That that isn't a joke. I, I drop like you know f bombs and stuff. So um just just be aware of that. There there's a lot of silliness, a lot of naughtiness. There there's a skit. There's all kinds of good stuff, but it is explicit, okay? You are entering at your own risk. Adults only, y'all. Okay, here's the episode. <laughs> and welcome back to Weird Animal Facts Explicit. And today we have a very special edition of Weird Animal Facts Explicit, as we have a guest. And it's not just my dog, nor one of the many voices that I do during the show. This guy's real. Today joining me is John Rossi, a real cool guy who gets paid to make lots of noise. The many ways that John makes noise are as a drummer, actor, music director, producer, and arranger. He's the Lynn manuel Miranda of the drumming world. And now possibly the animal world, as John also has an undeniable passion for animals and conservation. And like so many of us, he decided to show off his passion for wildlife by creating, yep, yes, yet another podcast. But unlike that guy you went to high school with whose dream is to become the next Joe Rogan so he can just sit in his parents' basement smoking pot all day, John is an exceptional interviewer who interviews zookeepers of all kinds and hope to help protect and save the animals we all love. It's like if the child of Betty White and John Bonham had a podcast and sounded like Will Forte. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you Will Forte's voice double and host of the Rossafari podcast, John Rossi. Hi, I am definitely not just a voice that Deidre does. I am definitely not doing an impression of, of myself right now. I am super real and not just a voice in Deidre's head, probably. I tell myself as the voice just comes out of nowhere. No, John's a real guy. In fact, if you want to know more about him, he's got his own podcast. But wait till you're done with this episode. Then go check out his podcast. Speaking of your podcast, John, can you tell us a little bit about it? Sure. It's called The Rossafari Podcast because my last name is Rossi and it's like a pun, Rossafari, like a safari. And it seemed so brilliant to tell people that until I realized that every time I'm meeting somebody and say, yeah, I have this podcast you should check out. It's called Raw Safari. No, no, it's R O S S. Ah, oh, fuck. Okay, no, seriously. Let me just. He, here's a card. Here's a card because that is that is the choice that I made. But it's a it's a fun podcast. We interview zookeepers and other people in the conservation world and conservation field, and um, 
there there's it's it's less explicit than this one but also there is uh, a similar vein of humor and i make some funny songs and and goofy stuff and and i also do multiple voices where i pretend i'm different characters so he doesn't pretend to be the other zookeeper. No, though. Uh, except for that one interview <laughs> where uh, the person had to cancel and I did, but no one knows about oh, that. Okay. So. <laughs> oh, shh. Sorry. <laughs> it's called the Raw Safari <laughs> Podcast, and you should definitely check it out when you are done listening to this one. And we will put a link in the show notes so you guys are all done. Listen to this. Click on that. Jump on over there, and you can listen to me chat it up with him and talk about porcupine ejaculation. It's true. Not one, but two porcupine ejaculation oh, yeah. stories. Uh, speaking of stories and songs, have you ever written an animal song before, John? Well, um, a, a full song, no. But but if you if you listen to my podcast, especially the Zoo News episodes, so every week on Friday, I release an episode of what's going on in the world of zoos, aquariums, and conservation. Um, I put in song parody type things that I have written and generally just do all myself or my buddy Taylor helps me with. And so there's a, there's a parody of blue suede shoes on there called, uh, blue zoo news. And, um, my favorite one that I've ever done is my stereotypical animal podcast theme song, which is literally just what it sounds like. It is a bad African song with animal noises and me singing about the fact that this is what stereotypical animal podcast theme songs sound like. I do like your song. I like that poop song. Oh yes, the poop story song. Woo! It is a yeah, jam. Yeah, and the fact that you have like music background kind of puts me to shame. Like I do some songs too, but I don't know if I uh, if I, I do it as well as uh, some of yours because you you get. I'm just like I can make the words. Yeah, no, I, I've been I've been listening to your <laughs> podcast and you do make songs. I will I will tell you that that is what you do. <laughs> <laughs> yes, those are songs. Technically, those are That's songs. It, <laughs> And that'd be great, but they're songs. <laughs> I will tell you, I put more time into a 15 second parody song than I do into the rest of the episode sometimes. Oh my gosh. Yeah. I'll be like writing and then all of a sudden I'm like, a song's right here and I'll stop everything I'm doing. And I'm like, song time. Yeah. Oh, also, also <laughs> as a side note, since you are a podcaster, you'll appreciate this. Um, I start every, uh, one of my interview episodes with a, a joke. Normally I say, you know, welcome back to, and then I insert a joke about the podcast or the episode or something. And then I say, on the Raw Safari podcast, and that will derail me more than anything else. I never prep the joke. I never think about it. I start recording, and I go, hi, hello, how are you? Welcome back to – ah, shit. And then I just pause, and then I just sit there trying to come up with the joke, and sometimes it comes quickly, and sometimes I, like, walk for an hour. Do you, do you edit that out? Because I feel like – I've listened to quite a few of your podcasts, and I feel like I, uh, I haven't noticed the – the blank stare Oh no, yeah, I'm I'm very good at audio editing, which is the only reason that my <laughs> podcast doesn't sound like a complete disaster because yeah, I am. Me too. So we'll I will say the fans listen to this episode will uh, get a better glimpse into how I actually record cuz most of my episodes are very edited cuz a lot of sounds and a lot of voices, which we'll do some that we'll keep some of that stuff in here today, guys. Don't worry about that. Uh, but since we have a buddy with us today, we're going to do things a little bit differently. So uh, they're getting a glimpse into the real brain of Deidre and John. I keep promising people <laughs> that one day I'm going to do an episode of like Zoo News where it's not interviews, where I don't edit, where it's just my rambling and you just hear me say the wrong species name or the wrong animal and then just go, shit, fuck. And then, oh, you know. well, uh, we oh. do uh, scientific names are oh, hard. We'll get oh, to I that. Know. We'll get to that. I don't know how good you are, but I <laughs> suck at it. Yay. <laughs> But for those of you who are tuning in, you're probably like, why are we talking to this random guy? I thought this was about red pandas. Well, it is. And the reason why we're talking about red pandas is because John, fun fact, John's favorite animal is a red panda. They're amazing. Yay. Yay. Yeah. So why, why do you love, I mean, it's a silly question. I mean, have you seen a red panda? But why do you, what drew the red panda to you, John? Okay, so it's actually a kind of sweet story. Um, I've been going to zoos. For always. And as I started touring, I, as a musician, I started going to as many zoos as I could. And I'm sure I saw red pandas. I, I know for a fact that I saw red pandas. And um, they didn't really register as, like you said, anything other than one of the many cute animals in the world. And then um, I, I went through a divorce and moved to Philadelphia and didn't really know anybody there. And the whole thing was very, um, you know, intimidating. And uh, I started going to the Philly Zoo. And the first time that I went there, they had uh, three red pandas at the time. 
one of whom was named May, and May is no longer with us. Um, but I don't know what it was. But I remember I walked past that exhibit and I looked down and she was just sitting there. It was snowy. She was sitting there crunching on some bamboo and my entire heart grew three sizes. It was like the Grinch, like seriously. I fell so in love with her and she meant so much to me that I started doing research and I discovered Red Panda Network and I started paying more attention to the other red pandas at that zoo. And as I went to other zoos, I saw red pandas and it, it was like she was my best friend in all of Philadelphia. And um, one of the coolest experiences I've ever had uh, was, um, like I said, she passed away. She was an older girl. I think she was 16 when I met her, which is insane. Um, but her uh, brother, who who also was old because they were, you know, twins, um, lived at Columbus uh, for a couple more years after her. And uh, I got to meet him there. Um, he was just in a back exhibit. It was a whole little cool private thing I got to do. But when I explained to to his keeper – my story and how much I loved, you know, loved May. And by that point in time, I had established myself in this community more. I got to go and hang out with Zhang and I, he was, he was her twin only with balls. And, um, (laughs) so it was, it was really, really special. Oh, oh, that's so cute. And actually, you know, that's, that's what zoos are for. You walk into a zoo, you have this connection with the animal a lot of times people have it with red pandas. I see it at the petting zoo a lot. People walk into a goat and they're just like, goats, I get to touch it. I love it. But red pandas, because I don't know. what what it, Was it their eyes? Because they're cute. I, 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 or your soulful, I, I spiritual connection. Don't, I can't explain it to you. It was – just the it, right place, right time. It was right love time. at first sight. It was every stupid movie Aww. that you have seen where a dude. <laughs> Imagine the slow motion yeah, music. Yeah, literally. Eyes yep. turning. <gasps> it's literally what it was. Parts it was the, the second Red Panda exhibit. I had just walked by Spark and Kumbi and was like, oh, they're really cute. Cool. And then I went to the next exhibit and May was crunching oh, was bamboo and looking one. up at me. And I was this like, one. hello, love. Like it was, <laughs> it was instantaneous and it didn't change the whole time she was there. Uh, nothing at that zoo spoke to me like her. All right, we'll be back after this quick break. Check out the new nature podcast that everyone is talking about, Birds of a Feather Talk Together. If you like Radiolab or Planet Earth, you'll love Birds of a Feather Talk Together. Escape from the daily grind into the world of birds. Two experts and two amateurs talk about a different species every week. Recently, we talked about the osprey, Burrowing owls, roadrunners, pigeons, giant hummingbirds, house wrens, sandhill cranes, and so many more. We have a lot of fun every week. Learn more about the incredible birds around you and some that you didn't know existed. Birds of a feather talk together. You're going to like these birds. I guarantee it. And now here you are doing a podcast. Interviewing. Seeing zoos all over the world. Like you've met a lot of red pandas. Over 50, yeah. 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 Wow. More than yeah. me. And when I say met, that I, means like fed, hung out with more than 50. I've seen even more than that, but I've, I've been hands on. Yeah. Well, that's still yeah, a lot. No, it's it's that's insane. Still a lot. Yeah. I don't think I've fed a red panda. You're, Deal with the you're missing animals. out. Which pa- red pandas are small. I know. I know. But we are talking about red pandas today and they are freaking cute. So I have a, a very important question. I think I know your answer, but I'd like you to rate these three traditionally cute animals from cutest to least Let's cutest. do it. All right. Red panda, fennec fox, arctic fox. And disclaimer for people at home, red pandas are not a fox. These are just cute, cute animals. Red panda, fennec fox, arctic fox. Oh. And you must give us a reason as to why you're rating Okay, I can do all of that. Red panda, number one, because they are literally the Obviously. cutest animal to me. And actually, when Georges Cuv- George Cuvier discovered them, he stated that he had found the most perfect uh, physical animal, the, the cutest, most perfect animal that ever existed. He truly believed that. They didn't meet my dog, apparently. <laughs> um, you know, red pandas won't wrestle uh, on the floor and make noise uh, during a podcast interview, unlike some dogs. <laughs> They're sitting still right, right now. now. they are. Wait till people listen to my episode <laughs> with you, and then we'll see. Mm. Yeah. Um, number two is Arctic Fox, and it's a very close between two and three, but here's why. The Arctic Fox is not a cute animal. It is three cute animals. What? 
<laughs> okay, thank you. I was like, wait a minute. <laughs> Number because because their fur color changes with the season. Yes. Uh, you get the white fox, which is stunning and beautiful and sleek and awesome looking. Mm, you you get it. the the um the black fox, which is cool and funky and neat looking and and goth, yeah, very goth, yeah. Bit. But then my personal favorite is you get the gray fox where they're transitioning between the two colors. A little scruff here oh and there. Gosh, they, but they still look amazing. But they're so they're so messy amazing. It's it's the cutest color. And they're like those girls who can like go from wearing like um, a football jersey one day, day and then like a really beautiful dress and still look phenomenal. Yes, yes. They are 100% the like that, that thing online where it's like, if you can't handle me at this, then you don't deserve me at this. And yeah. the gray scruffy they is the first fly. this, but then the black and the white are, are really, you know, beautiful. And yeah. And I just, I, I love it so much. And then Fenix are also adorable and their ears are amazing. And the, the first time that I got to play with the Fennec Fox was high on my list of favorite animal encounters. Um, so that was a tough call. But at the end of the day, it's the fact that the Arctic foxes are basically three adorable animals that that put them up there. <laughs> but still nowhere close to red pandas, both because red pandas are cuter and because uh, I'd be screwing up the episode if I suddenly started espousing <laughs> stuff about foxes when it's a red panda episode. <laughs> Well, luckily for you, we I have already done a Fennec Fox and Arctic Fox episode. So if they want more information, go check those out. Oh, oh let's talk about more cuteness. Oh, really? We're going to talk more about to, me and my uh, face? Really? Really? No, of course. <laughs> well, let's see. Look, we have to go to Marion Webster because they define cuteness as pleasing and usually youthful appearance. Would you say that's true about the red panda? Oh, that's tough. Okay, so pleasing, yes. Pleasing, yes. Mm -hmm. But one of the cutest things, although I guess I can't use that word properly here, about red pandas <laughs> is that so many of them, especially when the ones that have their eyes closer together, look like super old, cute grandpas. Like that is – so many of the cutest <laughs> red pandas out there have old grandpa face. So I think it's hard to say because some of them, like like my buddy Bandit at Columbus or my buddy um, David Bowie at Cape May County Zoo, they have – very cute, very sleek, very young looking faces. See, I told you your dog would bark during a podcast. Ha ha. She's just saying hi. She's agreeing <laughs> with fair. you. Pa red pandas. <laughs> but um but but one of the cutest and May, the one that I fell in love with initially, had the dumbest old lady face. It's why I loved her so much. So so no, it was nothing like like it was cute in the traditional sense and it was definitely pleasing but it was definitely not young i think there's a reason that um master shifu was a red panda in in kung fu panda because he's just a super old kind of crotchety you know and a lot of these red pandas especially when they get older you see them crunching their bamboo and they just look like ah, life is hard well you know there is another definition it's obviously straining for effect so that that could that could possibly be there sure also, I didn't know that uh, until I was looking up more red panda facts that in Kung Fu Panda, that, that I thought we saw he was a chinchilla, honestly. And I was like, no, wait, he is a red panda. But it makes sense. I mean, why would a chinchilla be over? <laughs> I didn't think – it was a cartoon. I didn't think about it. They don't talk or do Kung Fu stuff. That's, that's fair. <laughs> All right. More cuteness. John, why? Why are red pandas so gosh darn cute? What is it about them? Do you know? I have three theories of my own, but let's hear yours. Okay. Um, well, first of all, I think the coloration is really cool and really funky. And the fact that their um, their faces have so much personality because of it. Um, second of all is because um, – fuck, I don't know. You didn't tell me to prep for this. God damn it. No, I'm kidding. I, I gave you an outline. <laughs> you gave me a script <laughs> and we're not following it. So <laughs> We're not there okay, yet. We'll fair, get fair, there. Fair. No, but um, – <laughs> Yeah, I think their 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 face has a lot to do with it. Um, I think that the way that they move actually has a lot to do with it. A lot of people don't realize that um, their fears of animals. If you're afraid of spiders or if you're afraid of s snakes, there have been a lot of studies that that show, maybe not conclusively, but at least that show some evidence that it's actually their motion that you're afraid of. And even if you don't see it moving in the moment, your fear is based on a memory of that motion and it looking unsettling. And I would argue that. 
So are you saying if I want to be cuter to people, I should start walking like a red panda? I mean, if you look at how they they walk, it basically means sashaying your hips and moving your booty. So yeah, I think mm, I, I think I that. would. Oh, look at you, girl. You go. Woo. Mm, wow. I got it. Mm, too bad it's a podcast. People don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> Trust me, it's it's a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we got the face for radio. <laughs> but um. But yeah, I think I think the way that they move is part of it too. I think when you just look mm-hmm. at how they they move, and I think also people relate to things that they know. And red pandas are not cats, but they kind of move and are structured similarly to cats. And also, yeah, they raccoons. got those cute little ears yeah. that are, people are like, "Oh, it's like a yeah, cat." Yeah, but tell me your cat. theories. Well, I agree with the eyes. I think you mentioned that earlier, and the reason why I agree with the large eye, even though their eyes look tiny, they have that big like white spot around it, but. Fun fact, large eyes are scientifically proven to be more attractive. If you think about, like, Disney movies, that's why we love Disney movies. Why well, why most people love babies? Like, they got those big eyes, and those big eyes are, are saying, please protect me, save me. And that's why we love them. That, that is true. Also, they, yeah, they got red fur. And uh, I, I don't know about you, but I think it's safe to say that most people in their, like, top five celebrities they would fuck, I think one of them is probably a redhead. That's fair. Yeah, yeah, I like redheads. Yeah, I'm a, you got a redhead I'm a, in your I'm list? I'm a big fan of redheads. I've, yeah. I've, 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 gone, I've gone down that road a couple of times, you know? And I'm not saying that the hair had everything to do with it, but I'm not saying it didn't either. <laughs> didn't hurt. Didn't hurt. Yeah, there's a lot out there. Oh, and then also, I think this actually might be kind of with your, your movement theory. They're just, they're like those Karen videos that you can't look away from. They're just captivating. You have to watch them. And it might be because they got that little, uh, that, ses- that sachet. Yeah. Red panda sachet. Absolutely. Absolutely, yeah. yes. Yeah. Um, you know, speaking of the big eye thing, um, mm-hmm. I, I had a friend recently tell me that uh, upon looking on Raw Safari on my Instagram and seeing a photo of a giant panda, they realized – Ugh, giant ugh, pandas. They realized <laughs> that um, their eyes are small and that the markings aren't the entire eye. They literally have spent, and this is an adult who is not a moron, for the record, um, (laughs) they have literally spent their entire life thinking that giant pandas have huge giant eyes because of the markings, and that is one of the reasons they thought they were the cutest animal, you know, in the kingdom. And now they don't think they're cute anymore? I think they still think they're cute, but um, feel stupid at the same time, which is always a nice touch, you know. (laughs) All right, we'll be back after this quick break. Hi, this is Kathy Hill from the Indian River Lagoon National Estuary Program. We're all about restoration, projects, and progress this season on One Lagoon, One Voice. Learn about the great strides the lagoon community is taking to restore and protect the Indian River Lagoon. Each week, we dive deep into discussions with scientists, resource managers, and nonprofit leaders to explore lagoon issues and solutions. From oyster reefs to clam restoration, algae blooms to muck, you'll learn all about the projects we're tackling to bring the Indian River Lagoon back to health. Click the link in the show notes to follow One Lagoon, One Voice, learn about the IRL Council, and explore our unique lagoon. Uh, Well, my dad had one of those stupid moments. I was at uh, one of the zoos I was working at. Uh, I walk into the commissary where the keepers are, I'm like... This gentleman asked if snakes had genders. And I start laughing, like, who's this idiot? And they describe the man, and it's my father. <laughs> and I'm like, Dad, you are, you teach children, high school children for a living, and you don't know this? And he was just very modest, like, oh, well, she was very polite about it and told me, and I don't know what I don't know. And I'm like, oh, well, all right, fine. But still, you should know. <laughs> <laughs> and now he can listen to your podcast and find out. Oh, he does listen, but... Sometimes they get a little too explicit for him. So, uh, yeah. Hi, Dad. <laughs> we'll see how many times we say fuck. I was say, that's so. a nice transition. <laughs> hey, we all have a redhead we want to fuck. Hi, Dad. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. <laughs> no, it's fine. My mom and brother are redheads. Oh, so he also had a redhead he wanted to fuck. Well, there you go. <laughs> oh, my gosh. <laughs> oh, I hope he listen to this. <laughs> Hi, Dad. <laughs> All right, let's 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 get well. We'll get away from the fucking, and well, maybe we'll talk about it later. I broke but, you, didn't I? Yeah. I just broke you. <laughs> oh, I, I I get broke. That's why we edit a lot because I break a lot. I break myself sometimes. I love it. <laughs> All right, let's come back to point and let's talk uh, more about red panda. We talked about how cute they are. Let's uh, describe a little bit more of how they 
how they look. Now, in case you don't know what to look at, jump to our Instagram at WF Podcast. We got images of all the animals we talk about. Red pandas will be today's. And actually, you guys can't see this, but John, his shirt, has got a red panda on it. What, what? Yeah. Yay. From the Red Panda Network. And there'll be a link in the episode description if you want to help them out as well. Because I know John loves them. Yes, and volunteer for them, actually. Oh, yeah. yeah awesome. You volunteer I do. for them? I, I am the uh, I am one of their writers, one of their volunteer writers, and also wow. their zoo coordinator, um, meaning like for Red Panda Day, International Red Panda Day and stuff, I um, connect with all the zoos and connect them with resources and, and how to help Red Panda Network. See, John knows all. So – Tell us, what what does a red panda look like? Let's start with the nose and work down to the booty. Okay. So the red panda nose is the only part, other than the actual eyes, of a red panda that is not covered in fur. And that is not common in animals. Even really furry animals have, like, the bottom of their feet are going to be not furry and stuff. But uh, red pandas have fur on every inch of their body except for their eyeballs and their cute little adorable noses, um, which are cute and adorable and little and they they stick out um and then usually there it's a black nose and then it, it's you know uh goes for back to the snoot and there's some uh, adorableness there and um their faces are damn it i really need to stop saying adorable um no 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 we'll just like how about this at home every time john says adorable take a shot oh god you all gonna die do you, do you want do you have liquor where's your liquor cabinet should we play this game too no because i actually no uh, i do have to go to work idea. after this yeah no this is this is a bad idea <laughs> gotta work with children after this we're not doing that <laughs> but um a lot of times their faces have like like so their snoot part will be white and they have really cute little mouths with really sharp canines because despite the fact that they mostly eat plants they are in fact carnivores and we can talk more about that um and then they have uh their their little you know white ears and then the rest of it is that red but it's 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 more of a a light i'm not good at colors i'm one of those dudes who believes there are like eight <laughs> colors but it are is you like, colorblind no i just am a <laughs> dude who hasn't put in a lot of time on that because i have no artistic skills so like <laughs> so you don't like interior decorate your house oh, you have hell no that yeah i don't i know that burnt sienna is a thing but i don't know what it means um <laughs> And I will frequently say a word of a color, like talking to my mom or something and be like, oh, yeah, I think this is this. And she's like, oh, so it's kind of green. And I'm like, <laughs> I meant black. <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> um, but so that you, you guys know what red pandas look like. But they have the, the red fur and then it goes all the way down the back. And then they're kind of split in the middle going down as far as their fur color. The top part is red and the bottom part is black. And uh, the reason why that is, is that um, where they're from, uh, especially in the, the area of Nepal that they, they live in, they're in Nepal and China and into India a little bit and stuff. And uh, in the forests there, there are a lot of red mosses in the trees that are the exact color of the red of the red panda. So the red blends in with those mosses and the black makes it so that predators looking up from the ground won't see them, losing them in the shadows of the leaves. So it's a really cool, really cute form of camouflage. That's called counter shading. Yeah. Woo. Science terms you learned about in high school but forgot. <laughs> you you did high school differently than me because um, I did not <laughs> learn anything. But uh, – and then the, they have um, really big feet and like I said, they're completely furry, which helps them climb up and down things. And uh, the feet are black and they have semi-retractable claws but they're always going to be out and they are sharp. They are really sharp. In my encounters with pandas, I have had more than a few get really uh, enthusiastic. The only scar that I have that comes from an animal is a red panda who was mad that I was taking the time to feed her children as well as her. Um, and, and <laughs> What a great mom. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And she just very casually stuck her claws into my hand and pulled it back over away from the kids to her. And I was like, well. Mom deserved love too, not just the kids. I was feeding she all hard. of them though. But she anyway. works hard for the yeah, money. Yeah, she does. Uh, especially with those cubs because they were they were a lot. <laughs> um, but yeah, and, uh, and one of the other cool things about pandas, even though I guess it's not a visual thing, but um, their wrists have a bone that allows it to turn in such a way that when they climb up trees, they climb up trees. And when they climb down trees, they actually climb down trees head first, which is, again, pretty rare in, in, amongst mammals. Um, There's a few other animals that do that. 
like the kawadi. We've talked about kawadis, and I love kawadis. They're so cute. Who else do it? Raccoons do it. We talked about raccoons. And I believe giant pandas do it, too, but we don't talk about them. <laughs> yeah, that's a thing. Um, but, yeah, and, and they also have my favorite, my favorite physical adaptation of red pandas is that they have a pseudo-thumb. And I think this— Like a pseudo-penis the Fusa has, but it's a pseudo-thumb. Yes, yes. Yes. Female Fusa. Um, and, well, yeah, males have just a penis. Penis. But uh, <laughs> a pseudo-pseudo penis and double negatives <laughs> makes it a penis. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> but the pseudo-thumb is this extra bone that is like a thumb but doesn't move. They don't have the ability to control it like they do. I'm wiggling my fingers. But A, we're not on camera. And B, I realized I was doing it off camera. So even Deidre <laughs> couldn't see me doing it. So We can sense it in your soul. Yes, yes. But, People um, at home, wiggle your fingers. <laughs> <laughs> but so so what they do is they will they will hold they will use it to hold something like they will stick bamboo like a bamboo stalk in there and grasp it with their other fingers better and it makes it look like they're using their hands like a hand and it really helps them with supporting the bamboo that they eat so much of and it is really cool and um I, I, as a drummer I kind of wish I had one to just make sure I don't drop <laughs> sticks as often. Well, no, it's cool about that. I was doing some research and I found that. We'll get more into their uh, taxonomy later. But the red panda pseudo thumb actually evolved completely independently from the giant panda. So the giant panda, they think they developed it so they could eat bamboo and be lazy little buttheads. Where the red panda, since they're up in trees all the time climbing around, they evolved to have that little pseudo thumb to help them climb. That's the theory. Which is crazy. Like, so different, but they still evolved to have the same thing. Do you know what that's called? Convergent evolution. Close. <laughs> Convergent evolution. Ah, fuck. <laughs> One letter Conver- off. Conversion. Wait, what's covergent evolution? Is that am I just making up words? Uh, you might be. I don't know. I'm going to Google it right now because I don't know. I but I have also a Google machine. I should go back here. and listen to the episodes that I've said that possibly incorrectly because there's many episodes that I say things wrong, and it's not just the scientific name part. It's just yeah talking. According just to Google, English. Uh, according to the Google machine, covergent evolution. Um, there's one medical dictionary that claims that it's the same thing as convergent, but everyone else is like, do you mean go. convergent? That's, see, you just use that medical, medical dictionary. That's the medical dictionary I looked into, obviously. Wait a minute. The author of that medical dictionary is Deidre Ousterhout? I'm confused. And now it's time for Classify That Animal. Based on a vague description. I'm your host, you don't give a fuck, and our contestant today is John, who, as a child, no doubt annoyed the shit out of his parents by banging on pots and pans all day. John, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, and that's only- No one cares! I'm going to describe an animal to you, and you're going to tell me what it sounds like. Are you ready? Uh, actually, can I go to the bathroom first? What? No. Sit back down. I wish- John, I'm just being polite. <sighs> Sit. All right. Here's the description of the mystery animal. Mast-faced, ringtail, and climbs in trees. Uh, look, I know what you want me to say, but since this episode is about red pandas... Um... John, I gave you a script. Can, can you just read it? Um, sure. Hmm. Thanks. Based on that description, it sounds like the mystery animal must be a raccoon. Oh, I'm sorry, John, but that's incorrect. Uh, we were looking for red panda. Yeah, I, I know. That's what I said with the whole... Uh, Here comes the next description. Their DNA is similar to a bear. All right, we'll be back after this quick break. Animals are taking center stage in research, not just as objects for human benefit, but as beings with rich histories and geographies. Join me, Claudia Hertzenfelder, on the Animal Turn podcast as I interview leading scholars about emerging ideas and concepts in animal studies. Each season delves into a unique theme, revealing how concepts intertwine or diverge, and this kind of discussion encourages a deeper reflection about animals and their broader contexts. So far, the podcast has considered themes as wide-ranging as law, politics, sound, the urban, and biosecurity. If you are interested in animals and unpacking the ways we know them, Find the Animal Tone podcast wherever you listen. Uh, is, is that the, the whole description? <laughs> Whatever it is. Look, I, I know it's a red panda. Read the script, 
John. <sighs> DNA, similar to a bear. Then, gosh darn it, it must be a bear. Ooh, nice try, John. Oh. But the correct answer we are looking for is red panda. Yep. We are halfway done. Here is the next description of our mystery animal. Fluffy, cute, round fluffy ears, pseudo thumb, eats bamboo, lives in Asia, and is underrated. Do you want me to just read from the script? Yeah, that's what I thought. Well, I'll be darned, it's clearly a giant panda. Oh, today just isn't your day, John. Because giant pandas are overrated sons of bitches. The answer we were looking for was... Red Red Panda. Panda. And now it's time for the final round. And just so all you folks at home are aware, John doesn't win jack shit, because he's already lost. But we might as well keep going anyways. I really don't want to do this anymore. Um, When I asked to do a podcast episode swap, I didn't think that meant I'd be getting ridiculed. I'm calling it. I'm ending this Zoom call right now. No! No, 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 no. Okay, there's only one more round, and uh, I... I think you'll get it right. Please don't, please don't hang up. Fine, but you owe me something for putting up with this shit. How does fun fact sound? (sighs) I wanted a redhead. All right, whatever, just get on with it. Here is the description. Their genetic ancestors are independent to all others, yet today they are most closely related to mustelids, even though they are now in their own family. Mustelids, those are skunks and weasels. Wait, it's a red panda, isn't it? Finally, John, you answered the question correctly! Woo! You put me through all this, and for what? Education? Well, that is correct, but don't you feel better now knowing even more about your most favorite animal, the red panda? Uh, Sure, are we almost done here? Thanks, everyone, for joining us, and we'll see you next time on... Class of that that animal! animal. Based on a vague description. Order. Family, gene, and species. So let's get into the taxonomy of the red panda. Oh, God. And I think before we do, let's let's try to say their scientific name. So if you want to Google red panda, and I will also Google red panda scientific name. Red panda scientific name. I'm going to try not to look at it yet. All right. Are you ready? Or should I go first? I mean, I know how to say it, so just... Go oh, for it. I'll go. <laughs> I'm also not Googling this shit because I, again, know it. <laughs> you know it off the top of your head? I think the only scientific names I know off the top of my head are Chinchilla Chinchilla, Bubo Bubo, Gorilla Gorilla, Usa Usa. <laughs> Maybe Canis Lupus. Gee, but- I wonder why she knows Bubo Bubo. Who doesn't know Bubo Bubo? <sighs> All right, here's the Red Panda scientific names in... Scientific names are hard. Alirus fulgens. How'd I do? You did well. That's how you say, how do you say it? Alirus fulgens. And if you That's not what I said at all. You're just being I nice. I was. But um you're cool, so whatever. But um <laughs> Alirus fulgens is is the species name and then there's this whole big debate that we're about to talk about, I'm sure. Um yeah. but so the other part of it can be pronounced styani or styani. I've heard it both ways. What part of it? That's there's no s in there. Oh, there is. So here's the fun part, okay? Oh, goodness. Yes. So, back before the- <gasps> Oh, wait, I see it. Okay, so let's- Okay, so- Continue, though. I see Just it, though. recently, they did genetic testing on red pandas and decided that however we do this taxonomically and have figured out that, hey, red pandas are actually two species rather than two subspecies, um, before that happened, the the uh, scientific name of red pandas was Alorus fulgens, and then there were two subspecies, fulgens- and Styani, which were also known as refulgens. So the full name would be Alorus fulgens fulgens, or Alorus, uh, sorry, Alorus fulgens styani, also known as Alorus fulgens refulgens, which sounds oh like gosh. a really <laughs> shitty sequel to a movie. Um, but so now they're still figuring out exactly how they're going to handle the fact that they're species and whether it means that it is a Loris Fulgens and a Loris Styani or if it's a Loris Fulgens Fulgens and a Loris Fulgens Styani. That's what they're working on right now because science. Uh, not only are scientific names hard, well, they're hard for me to process, but like. 
They're important, though. This is why I like to say them, because they help you understand who they're related to who, who's related to who, where they got this from, da 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 you know, all these little, like, things. It's important. Okay. But, go ahead. So I'm going to disagree with you slightly. Okay, I think it is a okay, great way to learn. It. I do think it's a great way to learn. I think it's good. Yeah. But I think it's important to realize that this is all bullshit that humans made up. Taxonomy. <laughs> Everything's bullshit that humans well, made up. Well, that's true. But what I mean in saying this is that um, just like people have said to me so many times, oh, well, there are different species, so they couldn't breed. And we just know that's not true. Tigers and lions breed, and they're called ligers. And a, a Fulgens and a Styani can breed. And, um, you know, like – it's it's all really random stuff that we decide I as guess humans. when you start getting down to the particulars like that, then you kind of compare it. I compare it to the kennel clubs of America who are like, let's make it this now. Now this. They get all snooty about it when it's like, it's a red panda. Mm-hmm. I mean, for a long time, red pandas and giant pandas were considered to be in the same family because they have similar looks. And they have the pseudo thumbs and they have the elongated, uh, flexible wrist. Like they have a lot of shit in common. And so when scientists were basing it off of those kinds of traits, they were like, aha, they're in the same family. Then when they started looking at genetics, they were like, oh shit, no, they're not. And now they're like, oh shit, not even all red pandas are in the same family. And like, who the hell knows on Wednesday, they could decide that koalas and red pandas and coatis and a dolphin (laughs) are in the same family. And uh, it's all based on what they decide to, to base it on. And, and some of my scientist friends will will heavily disagree with me here um but i mean it's 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 true in that we as as humans determine what matters for speciation and then we put that on them and and you know they don't identify as that they don't at all identify as that we could ask them red panda how do you identify yeah i i i I have asked them and they tend to identify as loving grapes, loving apples, <laughs> loving pears, and if you don't feed them fast enough, um, clawing you. That that's that's how they identify. Maybe they just thought you were a tree and just wanted to <laughs> wanted to climb that birch. <laughs> I'm a good tree. I'm just saying. You are. Yes. Yes. Well, not only were red pandas thought to be pandas at one time, they're also thought to be in the raccoon family, which I'm gonna try to say this family name, which I've tried to say before. Pronide, pronidate. That's how you say it. Pronidate. Nice. Is that right? You know that? Is that right? No, that's not red panda. <laughs> not red panda. Raccoon. Yeah, uh, my, my knowledge base is very oh, red panda. You know yeah. I, don't know. <laughs> so I have a very specific set of skills. Yes, yes. Like, I did not have to Google their scientific name, but then you were like raccoon, and I'm like, shit, to the Google machine. <laughs> well, then you can just say I said it right. <laughs> I'm down. Well, yeah, so they were thought to be in the raccoon family because – Probably similar to why they thought they were in the pandas, because they have similar heads, teeth, and tail. Then they're like, oh, no, no, they're a bear in the Ursidae. And that's because of the DNA, Mm -hmm. right? But then they did even more, like we just talked about. And now they're their own little little family group, Aloridae? Aloridae. Mm -hmm. Aloridae. And do you know, you keep talking about giant pandas, those evil sons of bitches. And uh, do you know which was the original panda in terms of what we found first? Oh, yeah. I know who the OG is, and it is the cute, amazing red panda. Yes. Yeah. So giant panda, months. I think they should have to change their name to like, – what What would be an appropriate name for a giant panda that would accurately – how about free-loading couch potatoes? Yeah. I like it. I, I, I was going to go with lazy-ass bear, but, but that works too. Ooh, yeah. Lazy-ass bear. That could be like – their scientific name, and might be like their common name. Yeah, I like it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, what did you say the bear scientific name was? Your something? Your what is it? Eurysidae. Yeah. Eurysidae laziasis. Eurysidae. Yeah. yeah. I like it. <laughs> Wonderful. Yeah, the OG. Now, red pandas, in case you guys haven't been convinced about how amazing they are, you should care because they are endangered. They live in the Himalayas, so if you ever go decide to try not to die while climbing Mount Everest, you could see them at base camp. But... They're endangered. And do you know why they're endangered, John? People suck. Because humans are dicks. Humans are dicks. Humans are dick, 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 dicks. I like that song. Thank you. I need like some music too. I just sing it. (laughs) But I think it punches people in their gut. But humans do a lot actually. And usually a lot of the animals we talk about, a lot of animals in the world are actually endangered because of humans. Hopefully it's not the humans listen to this podcast. But there are things happening like deforestation, uh, poaching. In fact, I, I read that um, some weddings having a red panda tail is supposed to be good luck, yep. which I don't think is good luck because there's one less red panda in the world. 
Exactly. And, and it's interesting, you know, when you talk about deforestation, it even goes deeper than that, but it goes into, um, how they deforest because they will, they will go through, um, as different plots of land get bought out and get deforested, it breaks up the overall forest. So in, instead of taking away, you know, let's say a company decides that they're going to get rid of 10 acres of, of trees. Well, that's just bad. But instead of taking away 10 acres at the edge of a forest, the way it gets all, all split up is it'll be 10 acres through the forest and then the forest gets divided up into small little forests and the red pandas and other species can't get from one part of the forest to the other. So then you get into genetic problems and you get into male pandas being stuck where there are no female pandas and, and all kinds of shit happens like that. And it's it's a real problem. Um, and- yeah, I just did an episode on the Syngus, uh, the elephant shrew, and that's the exact same thing happened to them. They just can't. They got to go somewhere else to fuck. They can't just do it in there. Like you said, genetic diversity, it matters. They got to be able to move. Yeah. Yeah. It's a real issue. And then um, pandas, uh, like you said, they're, they're so, um, you know, a panda pelt can be so valuable for those weddings and for other dumb things that, that make me hate humans. Are they soft though? I mean, I feel like they're soft. Way less than you would think. They're, they're bristly. They're totally so bristly. you don't want it. No. You don't want to kill no, them. No, I wouldn't. I, I, even if red pandas were the most popular, like most prevalent animal in the world, you wouldn't want to wear red panda. It's not soft. I think it would stink too. Oh, it would definitely stink. But even if you could get that stank out, they are bristly. That is the best word to describe them. I have spent so much time with red pandas and every time I'm still like, oh yeah, you're you're a bristly little one. <laughs> you're not cuddly. No, yeah, it's, it's really interesting. Their fur is definitely way more coarse than you would expect. Although it makes sense since they live in very cold regions and you know. Yeah, they gotta keep warm. Yeah, exactly. Um, but it gets to an interesting point. And this is one thing I love about Red Panda Network to plug them is that um, they, one of the things that you have to do when you consider conservation is it's easy to sit in our lovely lovely houses and say, man, fuck those people that kill a red panda. But when you live in a shack in Nepal and one single red panda pelt can feed your family for over a year, that's tough. And it gets more tough when those people don't know that red pandas are endangered because they don't have podcasts and and computers and the Google machines and all the things. And whether they know or not, it's their life that's on the line. So killing that red panda keeps their family alive so it's the, the i feel like the toughest part is is relaying to those people who like need this panda for their own finances and surviving keeping their family alive how do you tell them like find a different way to keep your family alive it might not work out but give it a try You're like yeah exactly i'm guessing is the red panda network doing stuff yes. with that or yeah like, and part so of education how are what are they doing to help they do that? so many amazing things first of all with the the deforestation we were talking about they are planting a ton of trees but they're doing it in these corridors that have been been harvested to bring the forests together so even if they only plant you know at one point maybe an acre of trees it's an acre of trees that is now going to connect to segregated parts of the forest which is huge for pandas um and then a lot of the money that they get goes into the local population uh especially they're focused on the pandas especially in nepal and um the 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 money goes to hiring people to be panda guardians they actually got into the forest and protect pandas from um do they get a cool suit and outfit i imagine like a red panda guardian okay so it's not a full suit cool. and outfit but the coat that they right. get is freaking amazing and i have been begging Terrence, the the guy who I, I report to at Red Panda Network, for one of these coats for years. I am obsessed. He's like, you're not a true guardian they're yet. So one day, John. Maybe one day, yeah, yeah. But they are, <laughs> they're, they're amazing coats. So they do get, which I mean is reason enough. But, and they pay them a living wage to do this. Mm-hmm. And then they also hire people to be educators, to go out to schools and teach people because a lot of the people literally don't know that red pandas are endangered. And so, you know, like you said, it comes down to making the choice of feeding your family or killing off an endangered species. That's tough enough. But it's 10 times harder when you don't even know they're endangered, when you just think, you know, I mean, look out your window and if you see, you know, a prevalent species, that might happen to them there even though they are endangered. I mean, that's why, like, um, the passenger pigeon became extinct yep. because we over hunted it because we thought there were so many yep. of them and now now they don't exist anymore but they're pigeons so i don't know if they were <laughs> worth keeping anyways Fair. but no same with the right whale they're not completely extinct yet but they almost are and they're literally named the right whale because they were considered the right whale for whaling i always thought it had something to do with like 
right? I had no idea. That, Fun fact. I found that out and I was like, holy shit, that's amazing. Um, and now they're almost extinct. Shocker. But yeah, but Red Panda Network gives so much money and gives so much effort to the human side of things, which before I got into working with them, I would have been annoyed by. Give that money to pandas. Let them go buy nicer homes or whatever pandas do with money. No, but you know, put the money into actual panda stuff. But instead, Red Panda Network works with the local community so much and employs, when they do censuses and stuff of the, the panda population, sometimes thousands of, of people. And that's life-changing. And then the threat largely goes away because when humans want to care about and protect and understand this species, and when they understand that ecotourism is going to bring dollars in if there are pandas to see, because God knows I want to give them all my money and go I over there. I would pay lots of money yeah. to go see a red panda in the yes. wild. I would freak out. I freaked out seeing a dead armadillo on the side of the road. I would, I mean, I'd freak out more seeing a live one, but yeah, yeah, I'd pay to go no, see yeah, that. Yeah. So by explaining their endangered nature and explaining what, what ecotourism is and by helping the people get safer, you know, stoves are a big problem in Nepal because the stoves are so bad and the huts are so just huts that if you have a stove fire, you could burn down an acre or more of forest. So helping people get better stoves, shit that I would have never thought of, that is having a legit impact on the red panda population. And I think that's amazing. Yeah, and it's so nice hearing – because, like, in all my episodes, I'm like, oh, here's somewhere you can go to donate money. And it's – I'm always like, it's help conservation. And now hearing exactly what that conservation effort is doing I think helps people realize that, like, oh, my money – this is how my money is exactly being used. And I think that's what a lot of times uh, uh, those those conservation places might not dive into when they're trying to get people to donate. It's like, here's what's actually happening and why – where, or where the money is going to help these animals survive. Because we're all the way over here. We don't know what's happening in Nepal. Yep. We just know people die on Mount Everest, and that's it. Yep. That's what we know about Nepal and the Himalayans. Now we know about red pandas and to donate to help save a species. Yep, redpandanetwork.org. And literally every every campaign they do, they tell you what they're doing. They tell you how it's going to help. They tell you how much money they need and then whether or not they hit their goal. It's freaking awesome. There you go, guys. So like we said – on the, on the episode description, you can find a link to the Red Panda Network. Click on it. Give all the money you got for Christmas, the holidays, Hanukkah. Put it right there, and you can help them out. If not, share this episode with other people. Share John's podcast, Ross Safari podcast, with other people. And you can learn about all these animals, zookeeping, red pandas, any animal you want to. And it's going to help us save the world for wildlife. John, do you have any closing statements? Red pandas are awesome. Yeah, they are. <laughs> That's, All right. That worked for me. <laughs> I love it. Thanks, weirdos. And stay weird. All right, all my lovely little Rossifarians, if you want to go and become weirdos as well, like I said, you can just hop on in your pod app, whatever you're listening to, to your little search function and put in weird animal facts explicit and follow Deidre as she gives you weird animal facts that are explicit. I just, I can't get enough of this joke, not going to lie. That might be because I'm on the West Coast and still running on East Coast time and my brain is fried, but eh whatever. Also make sure that you're following Deidre on Instagram at WAF podcast. Anyway, uh, cool. I hope y'all enjoyed this bonus episode and uh, I'll be back tomorrow with some zoo news. And remember the phrase bonus credits backwards is Stiderk Snob. The Ross Safari Podcast is produced, hosted, and engineered by John Rossi. Editing and fact-checking by John and Dr. Zoe Vesley Gross. Our theme song is Sevens by Nathan Burke, performed by Nathan and John. Interrupting John theme and additional voices by Taylor Isaac Gray. You can reach John directly on Instagram and Facebook at Ross Safari or by email at rossafaripod at gmail.com. Ross Safari is part of the Daydreamer Media Network. Now, stop listening to me and go visit a zoo.